My name is Leah Fanwick. Today is June 24th, and we're interviewing Louise Stern uh, for the Sanford Jewish Historical Society. Louise, thank you for allowing us to come to interview you. It's my pleasure. Uh, from your interview, <laughs> all your papers show you've had a very, very interesting life, and I hope you'll tell us something about it. Uh, I see your parents were born in this country. Yes. Do you know where their parents came from? Uh, yes. My grandparents on my mother's side came from Hungary. And my father's parents, we think, were born in this country. Really? I think that they were. I know my, mater my paternal grandmother was born. With my paternal grandfather, there's a little bit of a mystery because we always thought that he was born in this country. But my brother did a genealogy thing and it showed some discrepancies with what we knew and whether the genealogy trace was inaccurate or whether our family history was inaccurate. It's hard to know because uh, my paternal grandparents had died before I was born, and uh, in fact they died when my father was 17. So all we had are the stories that my father told. And he said that uh, they were born in this country, and that their, and that their grandparents came Excuse me, I'm going to stop because we're picking up all this noise. Probably mid-1800s. I think they were here around the time of the Civil War. I was going to say it must yeah. have been about the time of the Civil War. And I don't really have documentation proving that. No. It's just family stories. Right. So they came to Steubenville, or? No. They or went they... to, my paternal grandparents went to Louisville and stayed there. And um, Louisville, they had a millinery a... business. What kind of a business? Millinery. And interestingly enough, my Father went in the millinery business, and my uncle went in the millinery business, his brother. And there was a sister who, uh, in those days, did something shocking. She married somebody who wasn't Jewish. And uh, it wasn't that the family was that religious, but we never really knew her until very late in her life. That was something you, you just didn't do. It was a Shonda. I guess so, though I, I had the feeling that they didn't feel it was a Shonda as much as they just didn't like the man she married. <laughs> 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 so I don't know. They, you know, my, my uncle also married someone who wasn't Jewish, but he did it much later on, so by then it was okay. At that time, it wasn't <laughs> so much of a shock. Right, exactly. So that your parents were educated in this country as yes, well? Yes, yes. And, uh, you know, so was my mother. My father just didn't go beyond high school. His parents died when he was 17. And he went and joined the Army and uh, was with General Pershing when he chased Pancho Villa mm. in Mexico and right. then went on to the First World War. And then he bummed around for a while, and somehow or other he got to Steubenville. And uh, he made friends there, and he decided to stay, that it was what a, did he do a good Steubenville? opportunity for him. What did he do in Steubenville? <clears throat> well, one of the friends that he made was a man by the name of Louis An 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 Anthem. That's who I'm named for. And they met at a restaurant, and they got to be, you know, friendly. And they had the big department store in that tri-state area. Not, you know, I mean the small towns in... in uh, Kentucky? Well, no, it wasn't Kentucky. It was Ohio. West Virginia, Pennsylvania, and Ohio. Okay. They all kind of met right around Steubenville. And so uh, it was a big department store for that area. And he became the controller of the store, as well as leasing the millinery uh, department. It was a store, a big was, department yeah, store? Yeah, it was called The Hub, and it was like the big store in that area. So they drew from the small towns in, in that area. 
and uh, you know, it was a lot coal mining and, and steel. Right. When did you move to Cleveland? I didn't move to Cleveland. I only went to, I went as a uh, boarding student there. Oh, you went to the boarding student there? Yeah, I was at Laurel School. Uh -huh. And um, I think I mentioned that uh, I had wanted to go to Smith. Yes, you and did. my high school, I knew, would not prepare me to get in there. So I decided that I'd need to go to prep school. And my parents, you know, went right along with it. It turned out to be very fortuitous because at that point my father was quite ill. And he was at the Cleveland Clinic. So, you know, and I was in Cleveland. So what kind of a what was growing up in Steubenville like? Um, it was probably like most very small towns that had a small Jewish population. Uh, there was or, lots of integration with other was it kids. An Orthodox community? Well, it was large enough to have an Orthodox and a Reform synagogue. And my grandparents belonged to the Orthodox, and my father was among the founders of the Reform, and in fact was president of the Reform congregation for a number of years. So we mostly went to the Reform, but on the high holidays, we, when our services were over, we would leave and go to the Orthodox and be with my grandparents. You know, my grand, we'd sit with my grandmother. Did you encounter any anti-Semitism growing up as a child? I sure did. But it wasn't, it's hard to explain how it was. It was, people would kind of, they were just, they were very poor people. Um, we called them hillbillies. Right. And they lived like in a shack in the hills that weren't terribly far from my house. So I would walk to school and these kids were there, they were real roughnecks. And they would make all kinds of anti-Semitic slurs to me and to my girlfriend. However, in school itself and with teachers and the other kids, it was not apparent. And I think perhaps one reason for that was that most of the Jewish kids were among the more, I won't say they were wealthy, but they were among the more affluent. They were also the brightest, so they were the class leaders and that kind of thing. So that wasn't they, resented? There was, you know, if, if it was resented, I, I was not aware of it as such. I was not part of the in-group. <laughs> so, you know, that might have been why I wasn't aware of it. And I had a number of friends that were not Jewish, but that was only in school. Out of school, my friends were all Jewish. They all came from the confirmation class that I was part of, and that was my social life. Uh, were there any, what other kind of uh, Jewish influences were? Was there a Hadassah, was there a sisterhood? Was there, there was sisterhood. My yeah, mother Hadassah. was very active in sisterhood. Kind of like Jewish I know if there was a Hadassah, I wasn't aware of it. Uh, my mother wasn't part of it, and I was just not aware of it at all. Uh, when I came to Stanford, I discovered that there was, uh, what was it, the name? The Jewish Women. Um, Council of Jewish Women. Council of Jewish Women. I've never heard of it. No. I mean, of course, I had heard of Hadassah, but I had never even heard of that. And there were a lot of things I hadn't heard. And one of the things that we didn't have a lot of with the traditional Jewish foods that you associate with New York, being an inland small coal mining town, there wasn't any such thing as smoked salmon or lox or Nova Scotia. Uh, so, you know, we didn't have herring or yeah. any, any white fish. I mean, so we just didn't know about those things. It was things. difficult to get Jewish food. Yeah. What about kosher meat? Oh no, there was a kosher butcher. My grandparents were kosher. But uh, my grandparents were traditionalists. My, my family was very reformed and did not have any kosher uh, anything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and actually the temple that we belonged to 
this was an early, <coughs> excuse me, reform temple, so there were no bar mitzvahs or bat mitzvahs. It was just confirmation. It was just confirmation. There was very little Hebrew. And as a result, to my regret, I really don't know much Hebrew. I don't know any, as a matter of fact. I just memorize. No, that's that was typical and of the I, reform you know, temples. When I tried to learn it, I, I really, I was too old. I just found it too difficult. The uh, prep school you went to, what kind of a population was that? That was also mostly WASPy. Uh, I don't think there were any minority people at all, but uh, there were about two other Jewish girls in my class, one of whom was very friendly to me and very kind to me and would have me over for the Jewish holiday, so that was very nice. Where was the prep school? Well, she uh, lived that was in, see, I was a boarding student. But this, it had, you know, a small boarding population, but most of the girls, it was a girls' school, and most of them came from Cleveland and lived in Shaker Heights. And uh, so I would go to her home for, you know, some of the Shaker Jewish Heights holidays. Big Jewish population. Yes. And as a matter of fact, the school took me to whatever temple I wanted to go to. So mm -hmm. sometimes I went to Rabbi Berkner's temple, which was, if I remember correctly, a brick temple. I remember that. And then I went to Abba Silver Temple, yeah. and that had a beautiful dome. It was a beautiful temple. But I really preferred Rabbi Brickner's. And so I would, I would go to services. Oh. The other thing that they had, which was absolutely wonderful, and it was for the boarding students, they had a subscription to the Cleveland Symphony. Mm. So we went to all the, all the performances, so that was very nice too. Um, when you went to college, you went to Smith? Uh -huh. and there were a lot of Jewish kids a lot there. Of Jewish kids at Smith. <laughs> right, right. I would say uh, that probably 20% of the class was, was Jewish. And what did you study there? Psychology. I majored in psychology. And I guess I minored in sociology. At this point, I don't even remember. But then I went on from there, and I got my, you know, they, there was a teacher shortage here. And they were offering a wonderful program that uh, if you were a college graduate, uh, Western Connecticut College had a program where you went for, I think, three years. And they brought the professors down to this area, so we met in. Stanford, Darien, or Westport, and you could, after the three years, going just once a week, get a, a master's in teaching. So I did that. So where did you teach? I never taught. I, mean, never, never <laughs> taught. I went on to get my uh, degree in uh, reading, being a reading consultant. And I did that for about a little less than a year. And at that point, it was the last hired first fire because yeah. there wasn't a teacher shortage anymore. Right. So then I went and I, I taught under the title, it was Title, title eight, one. Title one, at St. Cecilia's. And I did that for a couple of years. And, and then I did a lot of private tutoring, but you know, that was the end of my real career. Where did you meet your husband? How did I meet him? Yes. Or where? I met him in New York. I was working in New York in the garment industry. And he was in the garment industry. And somebody who worked with him met me and introduced us. And, and uh, we began. Uh, he lived in Harrison, New York, with his brother and sister in law and commuted to New York with his brother. And uh, they were in business together. And then uh, when we got married, we lived in Yonkers for a couple of years, and that's where my daughter was born. My daughter Elaine was born there. And then we celebrated her second birthday in Stanford. So we, you know, what we brought her to Stanford. The movies. Mm -hmm. We used to come here to the first front movies, and uh, we knew we knew the community. 
and we had actually see, we'd been looking for a house and we had seen a house that we thought we could afford and we loved the plan of it but it was in Wilton and my husband was going to New York so we really felt we thought about it a long time but we felt that was just too far to go and then uh, months later we saw an ad that looked like the same plan of the house, slightly smaller, in Stanford. And we knew Stanford because really we came here certainly once a month, maybe more. And so we came up to look for it, look at it, and that's when we bought the house on Woodridge Drive, which had tremendous problems because the builder was going out of going into bankruptcy and it meant we all would have lost everything so we all united and we hired a lawyer and we saved our investment but this meant that those original people really knew one another and it was a very close nice feeling to that whole area it was very nice being there yeah there was a lot of nice nice families there a lot of good there. families there right who else lived there Besides George. George lived next door to us. Gail lived next door to George. Um, the Colkers lived up the street. Um, trying to, uh, Marilyn, uh, Marilyn and Paul, oh God. He was the manager of Sears. Wagner, did you know them? What was the last name? Marilyn and Paul Wagner, but yes. Marilyn was a, a native. Son, yes, yeah. And uh, the Chapkins lived across the street. All and these, Molly Weiss lived up the all street. All these little enclaves had yeah. a lot of they were nice communities. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. You've done a lot of interesting volunteer work, organization work. Tell us about some of it. Well, it was kind of interesting because I got into a lot of it because of my mother. My mother was living here and I felt she needed to get out and meet people so I would join these organizations so she would come with me and maybe make some friends. Well, in short order, uh, my mother met Carol Levine's father and so they Event. They got married fairly soon after they met, actually. So then my mother moved away, but I was still in the organization. So I just, you know, I stayed in them and what were some moved of from place to place. And were active in? I, I got very active in the library simply because somebody had asked me if I'd like to be on the board of the Friends, and I joined it. And you know how it is with most organizations. Yeah. They're really looking for people who do the work. Absolutely. And I was willing to do the work. And as soon as they find somebody, you That's know, right. they, they hang on to them. <laughs> they won't let you go. That's right. But they were very rewarding times because I, I did meet a lot of people that I wouldn't have met otherwise. And uh, I, you, I enjoyed the relationships. It makes you part of the community. Right. It absolutely does. It absolutely does. And, you know, I've always felt, and my husband too, that you need to give back a little. So this was my way of giving back. You mentioned that you were uh, very friendly with Sarah Walker. Well, yes. Uh, my oldest daughter um, was at the nursery school at the Jewish Center. And I forget who they had first, but he was really a, a sweet man. But very ineffective. And then Sarah came, and Sarah was so incredible. She was just wonderful. And uh, we, you know, I was active with uh, Lorraine Parker in the uh, parents organization for the nursery school, so that's how I got to know Lorraine. And uh, we worked very closely with Sarah, and then my other kids all went there too. And then we had a social relationship social relationship with Sarah and Jimmy for a number of years. And I, I just, you know, admired her tremendously. I thought she was wonderful. Yeah, she was. Unfortunately, you know, toward the end of her life, I spent a little time with her, not as much as I, I wish I could, could have. What she, else she, she activated? 
<laughs> Sorry to oh, how I, I taught uh, low cholesterol, heart healthy cooking for a number of years. Why did you do that? I did that through the Red Cross in the hospital. And um, I didn't think what kept me busy, but I, I, I was I was in the Smith Club for a while and on their board. I was active at the Sisterhood of Temple Sinai with the Gen 1 grad, and then we left Temple Sinai and we joined the Fellowship for Jewish Learning, which is Emily Korsnick's group. Right. But before Emily, there was a, a, another rabbi, Dan, I forget his last name, he was great. And uh, I think he went on to become head of education for HUC, but I'm not sure. But of course, you know, Emily was with us for so long and she actually became a good friend. Yeah, she was uh, wonderful. Yeah. Um, what, you got married, you said, in 19, when did you get married? 1951. Where did you get married? Today. <laughs> what? Where? At the, um, <laughs> I'm having my senior moment. <laughs> Delmonico's. 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 Yeah. And the reason why we chose Delmonica's was that my mother was highly allergic to everything, but particularly flowers. So we couldn't have any flowers. So we needed a place that had a decor that would be sufficient unto itself and that didn't need flowers. And they had all these red velvet trappings. And so that's why we chose it. And it was, a, you know, by today's standards, it was a very small wedding. I think maybe we had 50 people there. And we were ahead of our times because my husband had tummy problems and he did not want to have a wedding dinner. He absolutely did not want that. So we had a cocktail wedding. Mm. And back then, nobody was doing that. No, nobody did yeah, that. Right. That's right. Uh, tell me about your children. Well, uh, Elaine is, as you know, 58, and uh, they all are products of uh, Stanford Public Schools. They, Deborah and is kind of, I think, 56, 57, yeah, no, she'll be 56. And uh, she went to Roxbury School, and then uh, she was having a few reading problems, so we put her in Low Haywood for middle school. And then she went to West Hill. And Michael went to King's School for middle school, but then went to West Hill. And uh, Laney grew up in the 60s, which was a very turbulent time, as you sure know. Was. <laughs> and uh, she started out at a school called Kirkland College. And it was the women's division of Hamilton. Mm -hmm. And it was going to be this new revolutionary kind of an education. But in short order, she hated it. <laughs> she didn't feel that they were fulfilling their promise of a, you know, an independent college. And she left after herself, no, after her first semester. At that point, we had a ski house in Vermont, so in a sense, we could almost be Vermont residents because we were paying taxes there. And there was an opening in the second semester, and so she went there. And eventually, she graduated from there, but of... Uh, what was the college? What? what was University the of Vermont. Oh, University. Yeah. And um, she, she did a lot of interesting things. Uh, and she majored in Oriental Studies. So uh, she wanted to go to Japan and get her master's in the Japanese language. And then she realized that it was going to take her like 10 years to do this. So she decided that wasn't going to work, but she really did want to go there and at least investigate it. And I have to admit that my husband and I were not exactly thrilled with the idea of her going, and we did not help her. And she found out about a woman who was a quadriplegic, and her name was Dorothy. I can't remember her last name, but she was well known in Stanford. She was, despite being a quadriplegic, 
she was very active and she got, she went to Columbia and won a Fulbright scholarship to study in Japan. And she needed someone to take her. And my little lady, who was all of less than five foot tall and maybe 90 pounds, went to take care of her. And this was hard work because the woman was completely helpless and Lainey had to do everything for her. And she must have worked for her for about six months. She loved the woman but hated the work. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and they did go to Japan. And she lived there for at least a year and then hired her replacement and stayed another six months working for Nikon translating their directions into English. And then she traveled around, you know, the Asian area. Uh, she went to China, and then she went to Indonesia, and she lived in Jakarta for about nine months. And eventually she came home, and she went to work for the Asia Society. And that was a good job, but she really, this was not what she wanted to do. It was administrative work. And when she was over there, she had become fascinated with acupuncture and really would love to study it, except that she, that meant she had to go to England because there were no schools around here. And then finally, a school opened up in Stanford. Ironically enough, my husband at that point was in the real estate business and he placed the school. I mean, they came to him and he found them space and he told Elaine about it. And so she went there and studied. And so she became an acupuncturist and now she's the real old timer. Where is she and now? She's in New York and she really has a very fine practice. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's interesting. Yeah. And she teaches. And is she married? She is married. She's married to uh, Bruce Lipton, and Bruce is had studied to be a pianist, but he, you know, he gave that up because he realized he could make a living with it. And Bruce is uh, works for Jewish camps, kosher camps, mostly Ramah camps, and um, he runs their kitchens. You know, he's run kitchen at one and now he's running the kitchen of another and he does the buying for them and helps them set up and train the workers. And the other children? They don't have any children. And Deborah uh, went to Beloit. And Deborah is the only one of our children that went straight through four years of college. And she majored in, oh, she wanted to be a nurse. Uh, but then just before that, uh, she was to go, she decided she really had to give her artistic side a chance and there was a school she wanted to go to. So she went to San Francisco and enrolled in the school and lived there about 10 years. And during that 10 years, she got her MBA at the Haas School of UCLA. Uh, and she got it in not, you know, she was particularly interested in nonprofits, and that's what she's been doing all this time. And she's established her own nonprofit. Uh, it's one of these 501c and um, organizations. And her special interest is uh, sustainability of the planet. And uh, in September, I think. I they, they're not sure if they can do it in September. If they don't do it in September, they'll do it in November. They're convening a whole conference of people active in the field of sustainability, the leaders of, of various organizations. And it will be at the uh, Kayaka, and uh, I think it's Kayaka, and anyway, it's the Rockefeller Estate. And um, they're hoping to, you know, the idea behind it is that it will be an organization, it will be an umbrella organization so that everybody isn't doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. that, you know, that they'll, they'll work out ways of cooperating to save each one, you know, everybody money. So I hope it's successful. She's mm -hmm. certainly worked hard on it. 
And the other thing she's involved in right now is setting up a camp for teenagers to work in community service, but in the field of sustainability. And Michael bounced around from the University of Rochester to the University of Oregon to finally graduating from the University of Wisconsin. And uh, he's done a lot of things. He was working in hydroponic farming for a while. And then he got two Haagen-Dazs ice cream franchises in Westchester, so he did that for a while. He married Robin uh, about 22 years ago. Robin is a psychiatrist, and uh, they, Robin got the, a specialty, did a specialty in uh, what they call a medical omnibus, omnibus now. And um, it's coordinating the psychiatric problem uh, program in the hospital with the medical. And um, she really, you know, was fascinated in, in this kind of thing. And she got the dream job offer from Providence, and it's a hospital near Providence. So they moved to Providence about six years ago. And they're very happy there. And eventually, Michael opened another little ice cream store in Providence, which is, you know, they make the best ice cream in all of Rhode <laughs> Island. <laughs> in fact, he was cited for this. And uh, I'm very proud to say that Robin just was named one of the best doctors. You mentioned that you got a Lillian Moran Award. Oh, yes, when I was active at the library. Uh, and uh, uh, what are you active in today? Anything? Not a whole lot. Not a whole lot. I really wanted to work on the thing for the Lowenthal's that the Jewish Historical Society had because I'm, I have a great deal of respect and fondness for the Lowenthal's. I just think they're wonderful people and they've been friends practically since I came, you know, since they came to Stanford, I think. They've been quite wonderful to me, and when I heard they were doing this, I just wanted to do something. So, uh, and I, I love the programs that the Jewish Historical Society put on. I, well, I, 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 come, to, I come to a lot of yes. them, and I really enjoy them. But at this point, I'm a taker, not a giver. I had been teaching at uh, literacy volunteers, but my hearing got to be so bad that I, I just I was not doing the job I should have been doing. But the thing that I do now that I really love is I, I started having a hobby of doing beading. And I'm now teaching beading at the Bennett Center. Where? where? At the Bennett Center oh. to the uh, cancer survivors and their families. And I really like that. It's a lot of fun and they're wonderful people. It's just, I feel very blessed that I can do it. Well, and we're having a sale. Oh. <laughs> uh, we're going to, uh, Sandy Goldstein very kindly offered us a, uh, a booth at the French Market. So we're going to have a sale. Where's the French Market? It's dead, right across from you. Oh. Uh, you know, Latham, Latham Park. Oh, you call that the French Market. Yeah. <laughs> That's what they call it, I think. Anyway, it's going to be August 27th, ah. so we're looking forward to the public getting to know us a little bit. Okay. And then I was active at the fellowship for a while, but uh, now I, I mostly just play, oh, and I'm happy to true. be able to do that. <laughs> well, Louise, I want to thank you for allowing us uh, to come to interview you today. Thank you. You certainly have had a very, very interesting life. It's been a good life. And uh, I thought you were going to ask me some things about the early stores at Stanford and things like that. <laughs> I should have. I can well, remember. Well, do, do you remember? Uh, okay. Do you remember Greenberg's? Sure. Yeah, I can remember. I could just drop Michael off there, and I can't remember the salesman's name, and he would just take Michael and outfit him. That I would come in and all pick the stores, up. All the stores at Bedford Street. Mm -hmm. And all the stores at Bedford Street, right. There was 
there was uh, C, not C, but Miller's, Miller's Lilliputian. That's right. And then across the street there was Footform. Dina's. And, uh, Dina's. Dina's. And, uh, oh God, I used to buy all my clothes there. Why can't I? Ethel. Ethel Allen. Ethel Allen. Ethel Allen. And then the kids had the Bedford Junior. I think that they, they specialized uh, in the teenage polka clothes. Chub, the polka dot shop. Yeah, and that was terrific. Isabel Aland was around yep. the corner. Yep. They were all my stores. Those were all our. That was right. our Fifth Avenue. Right. And it was wonderful. It That's really right. was. Every one of them was. Yes. B. Altman was there. Right. And Best and Company. Best no, and I company. don't remember B. Altman. No, I get it. You're right. It was Best, Best and company. company. Yeah. But it was the ones that were owned by the local merchants that were really good. That's right. And they, they so specialized in personal service. Exactly. Yeah. They met shop. Right. And I, I think I was a patron there until they closed their doors. And the same people were there. <laughs> same, I don't know how long they were up and how when it was that they closed, but the same woman waited on me That's all the right. time. <laughs> yeah, they, were, yeah. they were very special uh, right. stores. Right. Uh, you got to know every one of them. They were local yep. merchants. Right. And uh, there was a special relationship with, That's right. with each, each That's one right. of them. That's right. Oh, and, and Mac uh, Franklin at Stevens. Mac and Florence Franklin at Stevens. It was a gift shop. Remember that? Do you know, remember that? They had luggage and they had gifts. Oh, well, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Stevens. Yeah. That's right. Right. And then, um, oh. then after Stevens left, at one point, Mike Parker had a lampshade store. Mm -hmm. Yes. And that was very nice. Yes. Foot form. What? Foot form you missed. I didn't. I said foot form. You didn't hear me. I said we got our shoes yeah. at foot form. <laughs> Samuel Calmer and, right. and Hoss. They were, they were wonderful. And uh, one of my kids had a real problem with one of her feet. You know, she was in, um, you know, when she was a baby, she had to have bars. Yes, mm -hmm. I remember And those. she had to have special shoes, and I would take her there, and they would take care of her. Yeah. And, and, and Hots, Hots was there, wasn't it? Calmer and Hots. Mm -hmm. Calmer and Hots. Hots. Well, I think they were related. Were they? I think so. Mm -hmm. No? I thought they were. And I used to go to your store. <laughs> and also, uh, what were some of the other stores on, it, on Pacific Street? Uh, on Pacific Street there was... There was a deli. Uh, Carp's Bakery. Oh, right. Uh, but then Carp's Bakery moved to um, Washington Boulevard. Washington Boulevard, and Laney worked. Laney worked there all through her high school years. Uh, there was. The and there was somebody named Phil. I don't remember Phil's last Phil name. Harwitz. Uh, Harwitz. Phil Harwitz. And I there was the uh, was appetizing there. store in Brazel. Right. Right. And. Uh, Max Myers, Weinstein's. What? Max Myers was the deli. Oh, okay. Oh, and then there was Spelman's Shoe Store. They were around. They were on Main Street. On Main Street. Yeah. Rimland's was the shoe store. Rimland. Oh, yeah, that was the shoe store. Was. Um, and then there was uh, the knitting place. Was, was that Freeman. Freeman. Sammy Freeman. That's right. Right. And there was Charlie Sachs was there. Yeah. Carpels. The grocery store. I don't remember. That one that. I don't remember. Uh -huh. I don't remember. Yeah, that. I love spent the Shapiro's. I remember Charlie Sachs. Shapiro's was there. Yeah, right. Tresser, who Tresser Boulevard, his parents had a store there. Yeah. What was Tresser Boulevard before it was Tresser Boulevard, or was it always Tresser? It didn't exist. Oh, okay. Yeah. But I was shocked to find out that Tresser Boulevard was named after a Jewish veteran. I never knew that. Yeah, yeah Sam I, Tresser. I learned that on your uh, your folding board, Mister. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I learned board. a lot of history on that. Yeah.
Well, again, I say well, thank, thank you, Louise, you. It was, it was for allowing us to really come and interview you. And now can I give you some coffee? And <laughs>